A very good morning to all uh, participants who have attended and a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you, Professor Costas, for uh, being uh, uh, able to attend at almost past midnight, uh, your local time. So it's a pleasure to host you uh, for the Burgi's uh, eighth session of our Business Live monthly series. Just to give you a brief introduction about Professor Costas, um, Dr. Costas is the Richard C. Tucker Professor in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the School of Biological Sciences uh, at the Georgia Tech and a program faculty for the Coulter Department of Biochemical, Biomedical Engineering at Georgia Tech and Emory University. He earned his bachelor's in 1999 in Agricultural Sciences from the Aristotle University uh, in Greece. And his PhD is uh, 2004 from the Center for Microbial Ecology at Michigan State under Jim TG. He's a very well-known uh, researcher in the field of uh, microbial ecology. Uh, prior to joining the faculty at Georgia Tech, he was a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT under the supervision of uh, Ed DeLong. And he's also interested in the biotechnological applications of microbial diversity in the bioremediation of environmental pollutions. The great majority of microorganisms resist cultivation in the lab. And thus his main goal is to study them using novel culture independent approaches like metagenomics and trans metatranscriptomics. He's published over 150 papers in these areas out of which 12 alone come in PNAS and uh, has received several international distinctions and awards for his work, including the 2010 International Skirman Award from the World Federation for Culture Collections and a 2014 Kavli Frontier Fellowship. He is also an elected member of the American Academy of Microbiology and in the top 1% of the world's highly cited scientists and engineers by the Cla Clarivate Web of Science portal. His bioinformatic approaches are available for online analysis for microbial genome and metagenome data through the lab web server, which receives almost 3,000 visitors each month. You can visit his uh, website at uh, nv-omics.gatech.edu. And with this, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Costas to begin his presentation. So thank you, Kamles, for this nice introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody, uh, uh, depending on what time zone you are. Um, here is 2.30 a.m., so it's uh, quite late in the evening. So I apologize in advance if, if you know, I, I don't have so much energy or, <laughs> or maybe, I don't know, some things don't come out the right way. Um, but I'm very excited to be here and give this presentation and share with you some of the work we are doing on describing microbial diversity, cataloging the diversity, and, and, and also, you know, obviously related to the taxonomy. So what I, I like to talk about today is, you know, the ANI gap and, and whether we can use it to delineate species and also uh, a web server that we have put together to catalog the diversity of genomes, so the microbial genome atlas. Um, so um, to begin with, uh, I'm gonna go first, the, the first topic. So uh, uh, the one of the challenges we have, I think in microbial taxonomy and especially the prokaryotic, but not only the prokaryotic, some of the microbial eukaryotes have also the same issue is, you know, how to define bacterial species. And, and there are several definitions and, and there's no universal agreement, but I think um, everybody will agree that uh, this definition uh, proposed by Wayne and Tal um, a few decades ago is probably the most commonly used one. And that is uh, a group of spe a, a species is a coherent group of strains uh, that they are more similar to each other than they are to anything else that has been described. And, and back then the most, uh, you know, powerful methodology to, to say how similar strains are was the DNA-DNA hybridization. And, and of course you need a diagnostic phenotype, uh, you know, to go with it if you wanna describe them as a new species. So it, in my view, the, the, the big problem is, you know, whether these exist, whether basically we have 
a discrete population of strains, or instead we have a genetic continuum. And I think that's one of the big challenges that uh, has prevented us from having a universal accepted species definition. And I'm gonna give a, a simple example from Nikolai to highlight what I'm trying to say. So uh, back in uh, the end of the 90s, so beginning of 2000, we've sequenced the first Sticoli genomes and the first Salmonella genomes. And if you do a tree based on them, you know, using, you know, all the genes or some of the genes, uh, you can clearly separate the two. So, so E. coli will be, uh, will be here and it's about 20% different uh, at the nucleotide level for the genes they have in common with Salmonella. And, and the 16S is much less than that. Obviously the 16S is only a little above, above 1% difference. But then in, later on in 2002, uh, the first uh, Echerisia alberti and Echerisia fergusoni were sequenced and they fit in that space between Salmonella and E. coli. And a few years later, myself and, and colleagues from collaborators from Michigan State from Australia, we sequenced several environmental clades of E. coli. We haven't given a name to these yet, uh, as far as I know. Uh, but they fill that space, uh, I would say, between E. coli and Salmonella quite nicely. And I'm convinced if we go in the environment and we sequence even more, we are going to fill even the other space that is there. And not only that, but uh, these clades, they came from the environmental uh, uh, sources like beet sands, water, water, and so on. They do have the diagnostic phenotype of E. coli. So that gives you the perspective that, you know, now it's not so clear where exactly to draw the line. I mean, um, the, the space between E. coli and Salmonella can be filled uh, with genomes, with strains, and it's not so clear where to draw the line. So we draw it here, so we draw it here, et cetera. So that's what I'm referring to the genetic continuum or discrete uh, units that we can assign to species. So to me, that's the big question um, that we need to address. And so I wanna show you a little uh, what we have done recently on this topic and actually uh, on the positive side that I, I, I start to believe that there are discrete units that we can call them species, unlike maybe what our E. coli walked so a, couple, a decade ago that maybe there is a continuum of diversity. So to do that, um, we are now in the genomics era. So we have thousands of genomes available. So we thought it's a good uh, time to test this hypothesis, you know, whether there is a continuum or, or, or actually discrete units. And to do that, uh, we had to figure out new methods because uh, basically we have thousands of genomes and, and some of these traditional whole genome alignments, et cetera, do not work. So, um, Earlier than that, we developed this, I, I, um, this metric, the average nucleotide identity or ANI, which is basically the, the nucleotide, the average nucleotide identity of the genes to genome share. So for example, you have a query genome and a database genome, and if they have 2000 genes, ANI is, is simply the average identity of the 2000 genes they share. And so with the ANI, uh, we have this, uh, a method now to screen a lot of genomes and see what's going on, uh, but that was not enough. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, before I say that, uh, you know, we have done previous work to show that ANI, for example, correlates very well with DNA-DNA hybridization. This is one graph from this uh, paper, uh, which basically shows you every dot here is a, is a comparison between two genomes and show you the DNA-DNA hybridization, the traditional method versus the ANI. And, and as you see, there's very good correlation between the two and the 70% standard that is used often to delineate species in terms of the DNA-DNA hybridization uh, corresponds to 95% ANI. Uh, so uh, I see somebody raised the hand, but I, my understanding is we have the questions at the end, unless you guys cannot hear me or, or you need me need to repeat something. So I will take the questions at the end. And so ANI was the best method from the genome to reflect the DNA-DNA hybridizations out of several uh, we measure actually. And there was very good correlation between the two, the 70% corresponds to 95% ANI. But as I was trying to tell you is even with that uh, traditional way of doing ANI, uh, we cannot scale up. Right now there are more than 100,000 prokaryotic genomes in NCBI. 
And so we needed some better way, some faster way to calculate the ENI. And so uh, together with a graduate student uh, at Georgia Tech, Sirag Gain, who is actually from India, and he's back uh, in India as an assistant professor a, a, a year ago or so, we came up with a fast ANI. So the fast ANI, um, you know, the paper is published in 2018 in Nature Communication. You can find all the information. But basically, it predicts the ANI with the same accuracy as our traditional blast based method, but it does it much faster, like 50 to 100 times faster. And it does it based on KMERS. And with CIRAC, uh, we saw that actually there is very good correlation between the traditional ANI and the fast ANI and some other competing, I would say, method, like for example, the mass um, don't give as good, uh, as, good as, as reliable ANI values as fast ANI, um, especially with fragmented genomes or genomes that are you know, somehow diverged, like the so 80% uh, ANI. Whereas our fast ANI approach give us essentially the same values in, in the range of genomes that are related from 70, 75 to 100%. And so with VAST ANI, we, um, we said, okay, let's look at the, uh, at the genomes that are available in the CBI. Uh, so uh, back in 2007, 2008, um, there were about uh, 90,000 uh, genomes. I'm trying to remove this thing. Anyhow. Um, there were about uh, 90,000 genomes, and so we did 90,000, uh, you know, prokaryotic genomes, and we did the all versus all comparison. So this is a key uh, figure, a key figure from the paper that shows you basically the ANI values among all these genomes. And so we are talking about 90,000 by 90,000, which is 8 billion comparisons. And so as you see on the graph, it's really striking. There is a clear bimodal distribution. So what I mean by my model, I mean that the, the, everything is done in a pairwise fashion, like you know the traditional way, for example, with DNA DNA habitization. And so what you see is either the genomes show more than ninety six percent ANI to themselves, to to their to their partner, whoever is the, the pair, or they are distantly related and they show less than eighty four percent ANI. And there are very, very few genomes in the middle. Uh, actually, there is only like 0.17% of the total data that are between 84 and 96% ANI. So when I saw this data, I became quite excited because it does indicate that there are you know, discrete units, like genomes either are very identical to each other and they should be in the same species, or they are actually very divergent. And there are some in the middle, but you know, it's biology, there are always exceptions. And uh, I, I will talk more about this in the middle shortly. The other thing that was very interesting to me was uh, the way we can be classifying these genomes to species is consistent with that gap. With that, uh, when I say gap, I, I refer to this uh, lack of data between 84 and 96. So as you see, when we paint them you know, for whether they belong to the same species or not, that's the blue. The great majority of the genomes that are above 96, they belong to the same species. Very few exceptions exist. Like for example, the E. coli versus Sigella, that's a known example, that's the green data. There are hundreds of E. coli and Sigella genomes in this collection. So they make a substantial part of the distribution and they are assigned to different, not only different uh, species, but also different genera. But overall, it's quite consistent with how we name them, uh, you know, that A and I gap. And I think that makes it actually quite exciting. And of course, there are also some exceptions on the other side, you know, organisms that are very divergent and they are still assigned to the same species, but they make a tiny fraction of the distribution. As you see, the light blue here is very small compared to the red, which is the different species. Um, and so this, uh, you know, was the first kind of strong indication to me that maybe out there in, the, in, in nature, there are discrete units and that uh, 95, 96% ANI describes it well. Um, I want to say here, uh, I open a little parenthesis, uh, other, um, you know, tools are available, like, for example, the MOTU paper. Uh, that are using not the whole genome. They are using some universal gene, like for example, the ribosoma proteins, DNA polymerases. And because these genes are uh, very conserved, much more conserved than the average, when you do a similar analysis, uh, you see secondary peaks and so on. And I think it's because of the markers they are used by these approaches. They are not so sensitive at the species level. Whereas 
uh, with ANI and the whole genome, we do see a clear, you know, bimodal distribution as I, as I described. So that was based on the genomes of isolates. And, and as I said, it was very uh, encouraging. Um, the question was, you know, there is always isolation biases and, you know, this is a collection of, uh, you know, thousands of genes, but they come from many different samples for many different researches. It's whatever you can find in NCBI essentially. Uh, so we also wanted to see what about the natural population? Do they also form something similar? Do they also have a sequence discrete area uh, 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 like we saw with the genomes? And so we tend to uh, metagenomes to, to assess that. And here is a, a, a you know a, a schematic of our approach. So uh, we are talking about you know you extract small fragments from the environment using bioinformatics. We can build the metagenome assembled genomes, the, as we call them, the MAGs. That's what MAG stands for. And, and so to test that idea, you know, is there a discrete uh, population there or there is a continuum? We did the following. We did what we call the read recruitment plots. Uh, so that's what you see here at the bottom. And basically what it is, is you lay out the genome, let's say you target the red organisms on your X axis and you map all the reads uh, against it. And so uh, if, if, you know, if the picture is similar with the isolated genomes, if there are sequence discrete populations, what you expect to see is all the red reads will map to the red genome with high identity above 95. Uh, there will be an area of no reads, you know, an area of uh, very, very few reads, or maybe some reads because, for example, they sample the 16S gene and it's very highly conserved. But the great majority of the greens and the yellows and the blues, the other organisms that are in the sample should be below 90% nucleotide identity. So that's the expected signal if we have sequence discrete populations. And the, the expected signal if we don't will be something like this. Like all the reads are all kinds of identities and it's a mess and, and you cannot really see an area of, of discontinuity. So um, to make a long story short, uh, we said many, many, we have examined many, many samples from different environments, the soil, the human gut, and we always or almost always saw sequence discrete populations. And so this is a picture from one of our very recent uh, papers on this topic published just earlier this year. Uh, it's a more complex <laughs> recruitment plot than the one I showed you before. This is, this is based on uh, Illumina data, so it's more short reads. And so the main panel is the same, is, is short reads are, are, are lying against the genome, the reference genome. Uh, in this case, it's a, a unclassified actinobacterium from 1000 meters deep uh, in the Gulf of Mexico against the metagenomic library that came from the same sample. And so, uh, uh, the other panels here, we explain them better on this uh, paper, on these two papers. Uh, the, the number two on the top shows you what is the average coverage across the genome, uh, separating the reads that are above 95% versus those that are below. So the above is the dark blue, the, the light blue is the below the 95%. And uh, I think what I wanna uh, emphasize for you here is the panel three, which basically shows you how many reads are in every, uh, every unit of identity. So this is a cumulative uh, uh, line that shows you how many reads you have at every position of identity. And so, as you can see, there is a clear drop of reads. There are many, many reads at 99, 100% identity. The one is above the other, that's why you don't see them. But when you do this quantitative view, it's clear that there are about, you know, two orders of magnitude more reads that are 99% identity versus 95, 96. And so we see something very similar to what we saw with the genome. We see that uh, bimodal distribution, and then all the other populations are much less identity, identity to the reference. And we even define uh, a new term, if you like, the ANIR for the identity of reads against the genome as a, as a metric of how clonal the population is or how non-clonal it is. So basically we saw exactly the same picture as with the genomes and I think that make it very exciting. Uh, that basically I think now I start believe that there are discrete units out there and, and we, we have the tools, for example, with these recruitment plots and the metagenomes to identify, track them over time or over space with the sampling and so on. Um, to finish a little on this topic, um, I wanna say that very recently some people challenged that. Um, so there have been, uh, you know, for example, two papers that say that uh, there is no ANI gap because there are genomes uh, in intermediate identities. 
what these folks have done, they basically sample this distribution to maximize the diversity among the genomes you sample. So essentially they remove this part and this part and they show that there is you know, a continuum of diversity. Uh, um, you know, nobody denies that because as our own work has shown, there are these genomes in the middle. And uh, I think one of the challenges for us as, as a community is to figure out what they are. You know, are they genomes uh, to become new species? Um, what is going on? However, um, you know, um, we have addressed some of these concerns. We offer our opinion uh, in the nature uh, communication paper and basically uh, we believe that uh, in this business, you have to have the quantitative view. Uh, yes, there are some intermediate genomes, but they are much rarer than the, uh, the ones that are in the same species or, or they are too divergent to be compared. And so uh, just to give you an example of what I mean, uh, again, from our recent uh, paper, I'm gonna go back to the water column of the ocean. So um, one organism that I like to study is this uh, group one Crenarchaea. Uh, now they are called the Pharmarchiota. Uh, so basically we have recovered the genome of this organism for 5,000 meters. And we did these recruitment plots using the 5,000 meter as the, as the uh, reference uh, genome. And so what I show you here, I don't show you the full recruitment plot, I just show you the density with the reads. And so you can see at the very right here, uh, if we have the 5,000 meter reference genome against the 5,000 meter metagenome, it's a very clonal population. The ANI is very high, above 95%, uh, it's 97 plus. Uh, then if you see, if you start going up in the water column, so you use the same reference, but now you are at 1,000 meter, the population becomes divergent. So it's only 93% ANI. And then as you go more to the surface, they become even more divergent. And so what I'm trying to say is, uh, if you look at the 5,000 meters, there is something that is a unique discrete population, but if you merge all this data together, you're gonna see all kinds of identities from 985 to 99% ANI identity. So I think the quantitative view is important because it reflects ecology and we need to see this data quantitatively. Another way to put it, if let's say in the 5,000 meter, we had the dead cell coming from the surface and we sample and we see that it's, you know, 89% nucleotide identity, that doesn't mean that it's successful there. You know, it's just sinking dead cell. Uh, it's probably dying, but it will be a, a data point uh, there in, in, our, uh, in our space. So, um, um, so I think if you look at the data quantitatively, you do see this uh, A and I gap and, and I think it's robust. Um, there is another big challenge here uh, is how to name this Crenarchiota. Apparently, uh, the populations are stratified with depth. You know, the deep population doesn't live well in the surface and vice versa, but they have the same gene content. So, so they, they are believed to do ammonia oxidation. They have the same way to make energy, but apparently the populations are not interchangeable. Like, you know, they are discrete at the depth and, and they are not mixing. And so um, what are you gonna call these guys? Are you gonna call them the same species? In my view, no, because they are not interchangeable. They might be doing the same function. They might be very closely related, but uh, they can live on their, uh, you know, and their uh, respective depth. They have adapted to live there and, and, and you cannot really uh, take the surface population and make it happy at the conditions of the deep. So uh, to me, that's you know where I think we need some brainstorming and, and how to deal with them. But uh, I think it's an interesting case. Overall, um, I'm, as I told you, I'm now convinced that this A and I gap is useful and is a good tool to uh, delineate species, but also you know tracking populations and study them uh, beyond I would say limitations of the data or you know the 16s not offering us the resolution at this level. Um, I think that was the first part of, of the talk. Uh, what I wanna do next is um, tell you about the MIGA, the Microbial Genome Atlas. Um, this is our effort to basically catalog this diversity, this genomic diversity is a collaborative project between my group at Georgia Tech and uh, the group of Jim TG and, and Jim Cole at Michigan State University. And the main developer, the main person behind it is uh, Luis Miguel Rodriguez. Luis is now an assistant professor in Austria and University of Innsbruck, and, and we continue co uh, collaborating from there. Um, the website for MIGA is uh, microbial-genomes.org, and, and I welcome you to use it. 
So basically what uh, MIGA is about is, is trying to be the genome equivalent of RDP and SILVA databases. So basically, uh, if you have a genome and you want to identify, classify, you can go to MIGA and do it. Like you can do, uh, you know, if you had a 16S gene with RDP or, or SILVA databases, but do it on the whole genome and using the ANI and the AI approach. And, and briefly to tell you how it works, um, uh, it's actually a very simple idea. So what we have done, we took all the genomes from NCBI, those that are uh, classified. So we are talking about classified type, uh, type genomes here. And we calculated the average amino acid identity values among all of them. And, and we don't use ANI here because ANI is good for the species and sub genus level. But if you wanna assess the whole domain, you have to go to the amino acid level. And so we build these distributions, like for example, the blue line here shows you what is the AAI values, the average amino acid values of, of genomes that have been assigned to the same species. And the green shows you the genomes that have been assigned to different species, but the same genus and so on. So now what MIGA does, if you upload your genome uh, to classify, to identify it, uh, it will search against uh, all these classified genomes to find the best match using the fast ANI and, and some other optimizations we have. Once it found it, it calculates the average amino acid identity to that best matching genome. And let's suppose that value is my, my blue star here, so it's 95% AAI. Because that value is within the species distribution, it actually is square in the middle, MIGA will tell you your query genome is the same species with the match because basically you fit within that distribution, the AI value, the best AI value you got, the best matching is within that distribution and will give you also a p-value. But if for example, your best matching genome is only 55% AI, MIGA will tell you confidently that your organism is, is different species, it's novel compared to what is in the, in the database. And in this case, it's probably a novel genus as well because it's outside of the genus distribution and it will give you a p-value for that. And so that's how it works. Uh, you know, it's a very simple idea, but I think it's very powerful and robust. So uh, this is the main page of uh, MIGA. You can use it online. Um, the, the database we recommend is the type map because that's all the genomes that have been classified today. And my students have put uh, nice YouTube videos, etc., so to tell you how to upload the data, how to interpret the data and so on. Um, here is an example of a genome I uploaded to MIGA to classify. Um, this was a Suanella Baltica genome. I uploaded to MIGA and MIGA told me clearly that I have a member of the Suanella Baltica and probably a, a novel genome within that species. And you know, it gives you the p-value for the classification, et cetera. And if you have been to RDP, use the Ribosoma database project, you will see the commonalities. So there's a lot of influence between you know, the RDP from Michigan State and, and how MIGA presents the results, but this is based on the whole genome, not just, not the 16S. And here's an example of a genome that basically it's novel uh, at the family level. So MIGA cannot assign it. The, the AI value is very uh, low compared to the best match. And it tells me that I have something that is novel at the family level. MIGA can do many other things for you. I don't have time to go over everything, but guys, you're welcome. You know, check the website and, and there's a nice tutorial and, and, the, and the handbook. Uh, for example, if it finds a 16S gene, it calls the RDP to classify it uh, using the RDP classifier. It gives you all the data that is under the hood. Um, it also gives you an assessment of the quality of your genome based on the universal, the presence and the copy number of the universal genes. Uh, and many more, we have uh, some also projects of, uh, you know, uh, highly sampled genomes, like for example, uh, I don't know, the Pelagibacter ubiquite, but we also have a lot of mugs um, from different projects. And very soon is gonna be a new project there that uh, is gonna have all the mags and SAGs and single amplified genomes that have been uh, released. So look for that in a couple of months. If you wanna search against all the mags and SAGs that have been described, I don't think that would be for classification purposes because all of them or most of them at least are un unclassified, but it would be an interesting question to see if your genome is found somewhere else and where exactly it's found. So right now we don't have that yet. We have, you know, only for specific project, but this is coming. Um, what else you can do with MIGA? Um, 
you can actually, you know, trim and assemble your data. Uh, so it uses a specific pipeline to do that. Uh, and uh, what else you could do and maybe interesting for people is actually to do the clades projects. So what is this um, is about if you have many genomes that are very similar, like members of the same species, and you want to know, you know, how they compare to each other and so on. That's where you do a clade project. And the clade project essentially uh, calculates the ENI values among them. So in this case, you know, we are talking about very closely related genomes. And using a combination of the PAM and the silhouette uh, algorithms, which is the state of the art in computer science in terms of classification, it calls subclades within your uh, species. And so uh, it, it will give you a resolution within your species. And uh, as a simple example, um, we did that with Bacillus anthracis. So for those of you that you know, Bacillus is one of the most uh, clonal genomes. So the genomes are more than 99.9% .9 ANI. And you can see that using the clade projects with MIGA, uh, we are able to uh, separate, uh, you know, classify the different Bacillus anthracis in different clades and subclades. Uh, and this is very consistent with the state of the art on the Bacillus anthracis uh, group, which is uh, uh, area like the people that study Bacillus anthracis, they use uh, a, a few canonical slips as they call them because they are the diagnostic. And you see that with MIGA, we basically get the same clustering, but we also get higher resolution, like longer branches, etc. So basically, the ANI value, even the second and third decimal point, can be uh, quite powerful as this Bacillus anthracis uh, case shows you. And you can do this uh, microevolution, microdiversity studies with a clade project. Uh, because it calculates ANI, it also calculates how many genes they have in common and which are different. And so with some scripts, you can easily extract, you know, which genes are the core genes, which are the variable, and also do the gene content analysis among your genomes. And so, uh, you know, that's another unique, I think, uh, contribution here that, you know, you can extract the data and see gene content difference among, uh, among your genomes for the clade projects. So um, a little statistics about the MIGA. Um, right now we have more than 1,200 registered users uh, and we have processed more than 30,000 queries from them. And so uh, if this is gonna be useful for your research, please use it. And if there is feedback, let me and, and, and Luis Miguel know. Uh, in terms of the recent developments, um, what I will say is, you know, we're working to release the the version that has all the mags and sags that's on the works hopefully will be available before the end of the year what is available right now you can actually run mega on exceed that's the nsf supercomputer so if you google mega on exceed you can find um, the same implementation we have uh, right now mega uh, the main one is run off my computer at georgia tech my cluster uh, and sometimes it's down because we are maintaining it or other issues. Uh, MIGA on Exit will be an alternative. It is the same, uh, you know, web server and, and you can use it for free. And so please use it. And uh, we are very close to release uh, also a, a container, a, a Docker container, so you can download and run it on your own computer. MIGA is also in the cloud in Amazon. Um, and there you can do your clay projects, etc. So far uh, with the web we have at Off Georgia Tech, you cannot do the clay project, but if you go to Amazon, you will be able to do the, the clay project because they are more intense uh, computationally uh, and, and they require much more resources. If, if you have a clay project, let me know. Maybe we can also do it together or, or help you get started with the cloud. I think that's what I had about MIGA, and I'm almost done with my presentation. Um, I want to touch uh, briefly on two topics, but not too much because I think some of the previous speakers of this series, they have touched it much more than me. <laughs> uh, but I'm also happy to, you know, discuss it and, and give you my, my, my perspective. And so I'm switching gears now. I'm talking a little about taxonomy. Uh, and so uh, with uh, Frank Loeffler and, and, and Rob Sanford and Karen Lloyd, uh, we published a paper last year in Trends of Microbiology with this title, so Microbial Taxonomy Running Amok. And what we mean is um, right now, if you have a genome, and let's say it's a, it's a classified, it's, it's a known species, 
um, if you search on the web, you may find a lot of different names for it. <laughs> so here is a table uh, from that paper that you know uh, shows you specifically the organisms that we care and we study for for bioremediation. So like the geobacter and the geomonas, and and that's an organism that we were familiar. Uh, but in 2020, the same genomes have been classified with Silva or the, the GDDB from, from the Australia group as a different phylum, but different, different genomes. So it's exactly the same organism, exactly the same genome, but they classify differently. And so uh, if, you, if one searches around the, the, the internet, uh, you can get you know, quite different taxonomies for the same organism. And I think that has created quite a bit of trouble. I think uh, it's, it's chaotic right now. Um, and that's why we said the, in the title that we are running a mock. Um, the internet has a lot of power <laughs> and, and you can disseminate information very easily. Uh, but I think we need to be careful. And also in this case, um, these taxonomies were available even before the paper that described these names came out. And so people start using it and that's how it came to our attention. You know, they were asking us, you know, what is our organism? Is it uh, geomonas, how we call it, et cetera. So what I'm gonna say is I think this is a problem. And I think we as a community need to come together and decide on some, you know, best practices uh, to basically deal with this because I think we are creating confusion even among us as experts are confused sometimes. And I think it's a it's a it's an important situation that we need to do something about. The internet gives a lot of power, and you know you can disseminate information, but some of the users don't know how to use it, and and they just find it and and use it, and I think it's creating much more confusion than it's actually doing good. And so I think in this paper we call for some best practices, and something needs to be done because the situation is confusing, as I said. I think a lot of these renaming and new taxonomies come from the fact that the original taxonomy has a lot of overlap. What I mean by overlap, I mean, um, you know, sometimes organisms that are assigned to the same species, they have so much difference between them, they are divergent, that they should have been different genera or even families sometimes. And so I think some people are trying to correct that, but I'm not sure. I think it's done in an ad hoc cases without agreeing on how to do it. And I think that creates the problem. And, and on that same topic, I want to say that uh, with Jim Tizi back in 2005, we had noticed that. I think we were among the first ones, uh, and that was part, part of my PhD, actually. Uh, and that's a graph from that 2005 paper, you know, almost 20 years ago, where we noticed that, for example, some organisms that they are assigned to the same species, like this Buchnera, uh, their ANI, the AI value is, is too low. It's, it's much below 90% and the 16 is too. So that's what I mean that there is overlap, meaning that uh, in terms of the gene content and gene diversity, what you assign sometimes in species, it should have been uh, you know, different, uh, different species, like they should be assigned to the same genus only. And so I think that's what some of these efforts are trying to correct, uh, but it's done in an ad hoc cases and it's not well, I don't think we have uh, best practices. And to be honest, in my view, we have noticed that you know, almost 20 years ago, as I told you, and you know, for the next 15 years, we were okay with this overlap. Like, I don't think we can avoid it. It's how we have, you know, these crime species. And usually there's a good reason behind the, behind these classifications, like, you know, that they are as they are. And so I don't think there's a huge need to fix that. And, and also it might be um, case by case, because in some cases, like, um, it's important that they are in the same species for other reasons, not, not just in terms of the ANI or AI value or, or another value, but there is some, some other good reasons. And so what I'm saying is we have noticed that overlap and we didn't do anything and I think we were fine. And now recently, the last two, three years, I think it's becoming much more challenging to keep up. So that's one issue I wanted to bring up. And the second is, um, so what do we do with the... Uh, uh, with the genomes of uncultivated, the mugs and the sands. And so with uh, uh, Rudy Amman and, and Ramon uh, Rosello Mora, I think Ramon was one of the previous speakers, so he probably has talked to you about this. Um, in this uh, 2017 ISMI paper, we came up with some standards uh, to use to name, officially describe these uh, uncultivated taxa that are represented by mugs and sags using the candidatus approach. 
And so if you have uh, uh, unclassified organisms and, and they are, you know, unculturables, yeah, you have mugs and such, that may be a good paper to, um, to refer to in terms of what standards to use, et cetera. And now this has actually begun the conversation to uh, make a system that, because basically candidatus names are provisional and they are not recognized the same as the names of the isolates. And I don't, see, I don't see a good reason for that. I think they are all organisms and they are equal to each other from that perspective. Uh, but that's the reality that they have been, been given the same attention and weight. There is this recent effort, uh, the C code effort to provide a system um, that is gonna give these organisms, the mags and SAGs equal uh, weight, equal recognition, even though they are not in culture. And the big difference of the C code is that it recognizes the DNA material, so the DNA sequence as the type, not an isolate that you deposit to a culture collection. So um, this is only started, I would say, this year. And, and check the ISMI website for more details. I have the website there, but I think it's a it's a reasonable effort to try to catalog not only the culture which the culture which have been done, but also the unculturables and give them the same weight, the same. Uh, value as the cultivated genomes. So um, I'm gonna finish with some uh, summary and conclusion. So um, as I told you a couple of times already, I'm more convinced now that uh, prokaryotic species exist and actually that 95, 96% ANI seems to be a robust way to discriminate them. It's not a fixed cutoff. I think it should be adjusted depending on how clonal your species is or not. But on the general, you know, looking at thousands of genomes at the same time, it seems to, to work well. Uh, there are exceptions. There are some genomes in the middle. Uh, and I think one of the big questions, at least for me, and I think for many others is to figure out what are they like, you know, are they the same or are they have evolved to be something else? We should call them something else, like a different species, etc. So I think looking at some of these genomes is, is part of the future, in, in my view, at least. Um, that picture is striking similar to looking at natural populations with uh, read recruitment plots and metagenomics. That's why I, I think I'm more convinced about that they do exist. And with MIGA, we provided a system to uh, you know, classify, identify and classify them. And I, I wanted to say also this, that with MIGA, uh, our approach is uh, descriptive, not prescriptive. We don't change the taxonomy. So MIGA is using the NCBI taxonomy and we could change it to another taxonomy anytime. Uh, you know, whatever name has been assigned to the genomes that what we are using, we don't change the names or anything. And, and what is using it's the NCBI taxonomy right now. It's, it's just a convenient way to find your best match and based on the ANI or AAI values to say how novel your organism is. Is it a novel species? Is it a novel genus? What it should be? And then, uh, you know, some of the additional and unique, I think, capabilities that MIGA offers, it allows you to do this uh, micro diversity studies when you have genomes very, very closely related to each other and you wanna know, you know, how many lineages you have there, how the one is comparing to the other, what gene content difference they have. You could use MIGA to do this uh, on a more high throughput uh, that you will do manually, for example. I think that's all. Um, this is, uh, you know, my group. Uh, it's a photo, I think, almost uh, one and a half years ago, like old. Uh, but with COVID, we haven't been able to, to meet much. <laughs> now this is changing. Um, I highlighted the work of Luis Miguel here and, and a few others. Um, if you are interested to join the group and you know work on some of these topics together with me, please shoot me an email. The email is costas at c.gatec.edu. Uh, the website of the lab is nv-omics.gatec.edu. And, and if you look under the tools, you're gonna find the links to go to MIGA, calculate ANI values, and several other tools we have developed, but I didn't have time to talk about. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you, Costas. That was really wonderful. Uh, we learned a lot about what ANI, AAI and uh, the MEGA server. And especially it was interesting to know that you have found out typical examples that are creating confusion in the taxonomy and with the taxonomy going amok. 
uh, it's really interesting because we our, our aim is to make the microbial taxonomists realize that with the C code coming in, uh, there is a lot of avenues we need to discuss about the metagenome uh, based identification of organisms, candidata status, and all of these other things that are probably going to create either a conflict or will merge with the ICSP code and, and you know, using our own taxonomy and how we can resolve this. So it was really interesting overall. I enjoyed personally, and I'm sure our participants have benefited a lot. Um, I'll move on to the questions. There are a lot of questions for you. And I'm yeah. sure you I should will. also say I should okay. also say that NCBI is mostly Bergis taxonomy, I believe. Um, so uh, they might they might also change some names, but I, it's a small number, so I think they are using NCB uh, Bergis taxonomy largely. Yeah. Um, so. But I agree with I... you on all your comments. Yeah. Um, I I'll start with the first question. Um, that comes from Bhagwan Rekardwad. The question is, today's classic concept of species-based is a result of limitations in cultivation and understanding actual microbial diversity. In this context, how does the 95% ANI offer to classify these organisms to perfection? So, um... I, I don't know. This is not an easy uh, uh, question to answer, but it looks like from mm -hmm. the metagenomes and looking at natural populations, like for example, looking at this crenarchia across the water column, but also um, same depth across the oceans. Like if you take the 5,000 meter uh, metagen population from the Atlantic is the same as the one in the Pacific is the same in the Mediterranean. Mediterranean doesn't get so deep. We have only 3,000 meters samples that, are, that I'm aware of, but it's the same population at the same depth. Um, so, so what I'm, I'm trying to say is the natural population that doesn't have the cultivation bias looks a very similar picture. So that's why I think it's something more universal. And I, and I don't think it's limited by cultivation. But the thing I want to uh, uh, you know, uh, ask people to pay attention is don't think it's always 95. Some populations are more diverse. Like for example, the right. Prochorococcus, the photosynthetic, the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the surface of the sea, we see the ANI threshold there to be 92, 93, because I think that population is older and has accumulated much more mutation. So my advice is always look at your data and see if you have a more clonal species or a more, you know, with more diversity. And 95 is the average, like, you know, having looked at many different organisms, usually it is 95, but not always. So I think okay. what I like to suggest to people is examine your data and the diversity you have. But right. the, existence, the existence of the gap is almost always there somewhere. It might be at 97, it might be at 92, I don't know. Uh, depends on the species and depends on the organism. Correct. Yeah. Um, so, moving on to the next one, can we find all metabolic pathways of microorganisms through metagenome? I think the answer relates to the coverage. If we have better coverage, the answer yeah. is... Yeah. So, yes, I think that's what I was thinking, that it depends on if you are able to recover a good mug. So, if you are able mm -hmm. to recover a good mug, and there are tools to tell you, you know, this is a highly complete mug, I think the, the majority the genes that the majority of the population that the mug represents, yes, you can cover it. But if it is low coverage, no. And usually a rule of thumb based on our analysis is you need at least five to five, seven X or more to be able to recover a good mug. So if it is one or two X coverage, that means, you know, how many times every position is covered by reads. Or if you have only a couple of reads, you cannot get a good mug. You, you need at least five, to seven X coverage to get a good one. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from uh, Ho Kian Mu. Uh, the question is, what's the biggest difference between GTDB and MEGA, especially in the taxonomy aspect? So GTDB is changing the names uh, and they are giving names not only at the 
species level, but also the higher, and it's based on the red values, which is mm -hmm. the evolutionary distance using the universal genes, the ribosoma proteins, DNA polymerases, those genes that you know are everywhere. So it's about 100 genes. Uh, and, and so they are trying to change the names to meet. So within a taxon, you have the same diversity if the taxon is at the same level. Like all genera should have more or less similar diversity within the genera, all families. And so they are changing the names to, to meet that and, and, and they are using the red values. And I think Phil, Phil Hugo has gave a talk here. So you may have it. Right. I, I just yeah, hope correct. <laughs> Uh, MIGA doesn't do that. We don't change names in MIGA. We use the, the, the taxonomy that is available in a CBI. And I explain you how it works with AAI values. So in terms of taxonomy, you will see differences because GDDB is making changes to the names of, of all ranks, whereas MIGA doesn't, doesn't do anything like this. And that's, why, that's what I try to say. Liga is descriptive, you know, this is what the genomes have been described, et cetera, it doesn't change. And I think GDDB and Silva and other databases are prescriptive, they are making changes. Right. Um, the next question is, is it possible to run MEGA with its entire suite offline? Also, does it also produce a consensus tree with single cell genomes? Uh, the, the answer to the second is no. Uh, it doesn't produce okay. a consensus, but it identifies the gene, so you can you can extract them easily and do the tree somewhere. Uh, uh, the, we are doing the last test on the Docker um, um, uh, container, so I think in a couple of weeks it will be available to download and, and run them through Docker, and you can run them on the cloud. Uh, there is definitely one in. Uh, Amazon, uh, there is an instance in Amazon that you can use, but with the Docker, we wanted to make it uh, so everybody can run it locally if they want to. So this is coming. I, 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 we are doing the last couple of tests on it to make sure it's working. Uh, if you wanna give it a try, let me know. Like uh, that person can write me and I will send him the our current version. It can be a good user for us to see if, if, if it's working well or if he can, uh, he or she yeah. can uh, crack it. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, the question is from Dr. Somak Chaudhary and he is uh, part of the genomics facility that I'm setting up. So he'll soon get in touch with you. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Joan Guzman and the question is, can you please tell us the reasons why do you think the ICSP rejected the consideration to use sequences at type strains? <laughs> Uh, you should ask them, not me. I, I didn't vote. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the right to vote. Um, yeah. So the reason, some of the reasons that have been put forward, you should, I think it's published, you should read, um, you know, but I think some of the reasons that put forward is that, uh, you know, the type material is the isolate in a, in a cultural collection. And so the right. genome, uh, the genome cannot replace that, because you know with the culture you can do a lot of things. You can validate the culture, whereas with the genome there were concerns that you cannot validate, and so on. Um, right. I don't agree. And with Rudy and and Ramon, we published a short piece in, uh, I think it was in Environmental Microbiology. So if you look. You know, with my name in environmental microbiology, we publish a piece why we believe that's not, uh, why we disagree. We offer our agreements and, and the other side also offer their agreements. And I think that debate in AMI, environmental microbiology, could be useful to read. Um, but the problem is, you know, with unculturable, something needs to be done because we don't have the culture there. And, and, and what I don't, I don't agree with the IS, uh, ICSP is to give less priority to the uncultivated organisms. Like they are not citizens of a second world. They are microbes like yeah. the rest. Uh, and, and with them, yeah. you cannot do the isolation period. I mean, yes, we should try to isolate and there is so much power in having an organism in your hands. Like all of us here that are experimenters, we know that. But you know, sometimes it's so difficult and, and you cannot get it done. So why not describe it? Like for example, this krenarchia that are big, 
important ammonia oxidizers, but we cannot grow them in the lab. We should be able to give them a name so we can communicate about them and, and they are there, they exist, and they are important organisms. We study them with culturally independent uh, uh, approaches. I don't see a reason that you know the name assigned to them should be of lesser importance or priority personally but you know that ami mm -hmm. debate might be useful to read i think and and if you cannot find it shoot me an email and I, i'm happy to share the the papers sure uh, the next question comes from uh xiaojian hu uh, the question is if ani is uh, greater than 95 percent for example 95.5 percent but there are differences in physiological and biochemical experiments how should we explain it when we want to de decide whether it is a novel species in the paper? So, you know, as far as I know, you need to show genetic discreteness and you need to show phenotypic discreteness to, to, to describe a, a novel organism. So if all your strains are, you know, very, very closely related and there is a 95.5 you know, they are more than 98, 99, and there is a 95, 95.5, as the example says, there is some discreteness between them. It's a couple units of ANI. And, and by the way, let me say this, a couple units of ANI translate to thousands of years of evolution. Like, for example, the E. coli to Salmonella, the ANI is around 82. So 18% 18 difference, one eight. And the best estimates we have is that E. coli and Salmonella are diverging, are, are evolving apart for 100,000 years. So a couple units of ANI corresponds to several thousand years of evolution. It's not like, you know, they would become a couple percent different in ANI within our lifetime. No, <laughs> they will take thousands of years. So, so to me, in, in that, uh, in that uh, case, maybe your discreteness is at higher level. And I think since you have a very important diagnostic phenotype, you should be able to describe it as a new species. So my suggestion would be write your paper and let the review process tell you what, uh, what should be done. But the way I see that example, if I was one reviewer, I would say, yes, do it. If, if there is some level of discreteness and there is clear phenotypic discreteness, they should be able to describe it as a new species based on that uh, biochemical or diagnostic phenotype. If I was a reviewer, like, I don't know how other reviewers will do. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, next question is, uh, what's the advantage? It's come. It comes from an anon anonymous attendee, and the question is, what's the advantage of KMR-based ANI calculation compared with ortholog-based ANI calculation? So the KMR also finds the orthologs. It finds the 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 pieces of DNA that are orthologous, but it does it much faster. So depend on the genome at least 50 times faster. So if you have a couple genomes, you don't have to do the fast AI because you're gonna get them done in a couple minutes. But if you're doing 8 billion comparison, <laughs> and in one case it does one minute, and the other case it does um, less than a second, that makes a big difference. <laughs> uh, but essentially we get the same values for genomes that are in the range of 75% ANI to 100%, like in that range, you get the same values. Yeah. Just um, um, if I can add the question to him, can I? Sorry? Uh, can I add the question to this conversation? Uh, yeah. Right. Please. So uh, with ortho ANI, the logical, uh, the logical part is that to, to consider the orthologous genes and um, uh, not to ignore, but sort of ignoring the genes which are which are not uh, common or the area of genome which is not um, coded one. So with with uh, with the KMR based uh, ANI calculation, will it consider only orthologous region of the genome or it consider the whole part? An additional sub question is that uh, the the length of the genome. The, there is a naturally two strains will have different length of the genomes. So the KMR based one and the orthologous will will have some um, basic difference there. Yeah. So look, uh, the fast ANI considers orthologous parts of the genome, but that includes the intergenic region. So the, the, the space between genes. 
Whereas if you do a gene-based ANI, you don't include the intergenic region. So fast ANI finds orthologous, but that includes also the intergenic. And I call them orthologous because they are. Uh, if you are doing a gene-based ANI, your value will always be a little higher because the gene regions tend to be a little more conserved than the intergenic regions. So usually they, they are not gonna match perfectly. And I think, you know, let's say for organisms, uh, at the 95% and above, there will be a 0.1, 0.3% difference if you do gene-based versus the whole genome. Right. Uh, and, and for us, with the FAST ANI, et cetera, we do the whole genome primarily. But that's an important point to, to, to make it clear that are you doing gene-based or whole genome, like including the intergenic region? Yeah. Okay. I think um, I'm answering the question, right? Yes, yes. I mean, that will be a very interesting point to consider intergenic regions. Um, and if you they should are, include them. Why yeah. not? I mean, especially with very close related organisms, they may give you the resolution you need because, as I said, they tend to evolve a little faster than the do they reflect? Do they reflect the ecological difference between two states? That's the I question. think yes, because usually they have regulatory elements. Like, it's not junk. For, for bacteria, no, it's there, is not not junk, so yeah. much, yes. there is not so much junk in the genome, but they tend to evolve a little faster. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so that's my view. Yeah. I, I include them by, defi by default, but it's also okay. true that you, when you do your gene content and functional analysis, you don't include them. You just look at the genes. That's also true. Right, yeah. Thanks, Costas. Yeah. Thanks, Costas. Thanks, Amit. Uh, the next question is from Yuan. What is this? What is the biological interpretation of the Thomer archaeota to see different species and different depths in sea? Is this speciation caused by mutations from solar irradiation? Yes, I think so. I don't think it's solar radiation because the sun doesn't reach below below 100 meters, uh, but it's adaptations to the hydrostatic pressure and probably other things. Um, but if you look at the genomes, you know, they are not identical. They are divergent. And, and if they are from different depths, they have more differences. So I think it has to do with temperature and hydrostatic pressure more as, as the big drivers. And, and with Ed DeLong, we published on that in 2009. So there is a paper of myself with Ed on what are the big differences we see in terms of which amino acids the deep organisms are using versus the surface and what modifications are happening. So I think it's, it's, the, it's for the archaea that they don't make it to the surface. I think it's more important the temperature and the hydrostatic pressure. Right, okay. Um, the next question is again from an anonymous attendee. And the question is, I would like to ask if it is already acceptable to submit a novel species description with just using ANI and AAI and without DDH. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe you should answer that. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. By it's... me, it would be acceptable because with A and I, with the whole genome, you get the same value as the DNA DNA hybridization. So I don't see a big reason to do DNA DNA hybridization uh, if you have the genomes and you can do the ANI. I mean, even even that graph from our paper shows a great correlation between the two. And and I hope if the reviewers tell you no, you can do that. You need to do the DNA. Answer back to them and say, what about this graph that shows <laughs> a very good correlation between the two? Like, <laughs> um, in right. my view, it should be acceptable. But um, yeah, I, I cannot speak. So, um, um, from just to add on that, there is a, a list of whole genome related indices and which also includes uh, the digital DNA DNA hybridization, or as we call it, in silico calculated values along with the ANI or AAI that needs to be included. So it, that, it, it is required to be including uh, both the things. Yeah, I yeah. think it's a good idea. If you are describing a new species to sequence, the genome is not so expensive anymore. The yeah. other thing I wanted to say, I remember from that work we did where we compare, you know, the DNA DNA hybridization of, uh, of genomes to ANI. We, we did the experiments actually, we did the DNA DNA hybridization. If you look on that graph, I am convinced that the noise, you know, there is a there is a, a regression line, and there is noise of the data around it. I think it comes from DNA DNA hybridization. Those here that have done DNA DNA hybridization, right. they know that it's a it's not it's, it's, it's a difficult method, 
you have to get good quality DNA. Right. Uh, so I think the noise that you see on that graph is mostly from the DNA DNA habitation. So in my view, that's another reason that we should start abandoning and you know doing the either you know the in silico DNA DNA habitation, which I think it's the same idea as the ANI or the ANI or you know a genomic metric. Yeah. Um, the next question is uh, uh, very specific. Uh, how is the threshold range specified for AAI? Yeah, I don't so, understand this question. He has to be he or she has to be more specific. What what threshold for what for this? I, I I think the question is how do you decide what is the threshold for a species level discrimination or a phylum level discrimination? How do you decide what is the range? Yeah, um, so so we that, like, like yeah. what I said in the lecture, we basically took the organisms that are in the same species and calculated the AIs and make the distribution. And that distribution tells us what is the expected value. So it's based on how genomes have been classified to species and looking at the distribution of the AI values. And then, you know, it's a distribution. So if you get your best value to be inside the distribution, you get a very high p-value, a very strong p-value. If it is at the border, it's very low. And if it's outside, it's yeah. more significant. And, and, and the, look at the manual because we explain how exactly these numbers um, are derived. But we don't make them up. We, we use the data and how genomes have been classified to, to look at the distribution of the AAI values. Like, Genomes that are assigned to the same species, but you know, all species, like all named species. Uh, we will use the genomes from all named species and make that distribution. So I don't think it's biased, you know, by a few phyla or or a few taxa. It's it's representing yeah. the total ta yeah. domain of bacteria and archaea. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Devananda. The question is again very specific for Streptomyces species. What's the maximum 16 sequence homo homology limit for an environmental isolate to be likely to be a novel species? Yeah. We are talking about a single gene, and uh, that's not going to be really accurate, especially with a taxa that has about 780 different strains. And Wen Jun is an expert working in streptomyces, so I'm sure he, he has a good answer for this. But mm -hmm. Costa can try first and then Wen Jun. My answer would be 98.5% 16S identity. Like if your genome, the 16S identity to anything that has been described is less than 98.5, it's highly unlikely right. that they and I will be above 90, 95. Um, I think you are you have a novel organism in your hands, and if you have a diagnostic phenotype, you could describe it as a novel species. It would be nice to sequence the right. genome because I think that's where we are going, and, and we should all try to do that. But I, I I still believe the 16s a lot. Just you know, when you have a max that is above 98.5, you don't know. You you could still have a novel organism, very divergent. But the 16S is so conserved to, to the close relative, uh, and you have to, to look at the genome. But 98.5, yeah. I think what people will use right now, the 97, okay. which was the original one, um, there is a lot of work that shows that it was too, um, too liberal. It, it can be higher, more streets, 98.5 or 0.6 for the 16S. Okay. Venjan, you would like to add something, especially yeah. for streptomyces? Okay, first of all, about, uh, okay, Constantly, uh, uh, thank you very much for your wonderful and uh, informative uh, talk. I learned much more information from your uh, presentation. Just the question, you know, for the streptomyces, uh, I know this uh, participants, I have some collaborative uh, with this uh, uh, scientist, you know, before I have talked this question with uh, Professor Chung Sak Chun, you know, from uh, Seoul National University, he okay. gave the answers, you know, for the streptomyces. More, uh, even 16 SR genes with 90-90% uh, similarities, even maybe is uh, uh, most, the candidates potential novel species. So this streptomyces is more unique than other actin bacteria. 
Yeah. But here, you know, Kamlesh, I have one question to ask the yeah. Einsteinian. You know, uh, your talk is very important for our technomics and even for microbiosystematics. Just the, I, I'm special, uh, you know, uh, noticed that many participants ask, ask the, the almost the similar questions. You know, your database for the, uh, you know, metagenomes and also uh, the big group from Australia, you know, last time they also invited uh, uh, Philip uh, Hanhorst, how to give the talks, mm -hmm. GTTB database. And also just that the uh, participants asked the question about the uh, other database. You know, for our technomics, the big challenge is the for the uh, uh, for the culture cultivable uh, you know uh, uh, how to say is the uh, uh, culturable species our uh, genome sequence still not finished only almost half finished still have not mm -hmm. finished but for the managed genomics the database expand very quickly. Just the, right. I, I, I found the your group just published one paper from uh, in electric communications. You you mentioned that you you have more than one thousand metagenomes about the, the actin bacteria. You know my group is always focused on the actin bacteria. We just published one paper in ISMI General just this April, uh, just this uh, May. We we only. Uh, uh, re released uh, about the maybe less than 100, less than 100 metagenomes about uh, uh, on the acting bacteria. But yours database is more than 1,000. Even for me, I don't know the, this information. You know, the, the, so the communication is so important. Met metagenomics expand too quickly. For our technomics, for uh, systematics, it's so difficult. How to, my question is, is possible how to make a unit for different database, you know, in the same, okay. same community, uh, community yeah. uh, how, how to say, uh, make, I, I mean, make all the uh, researchers to get the right database. This is my uh, uh, question. Uh, so, understand? So, yeah. yeah. I think I understand. So, I, I have a few comments. So, um, you know, for us and also for GDDB, yeah. it's not a problem because you can extract the A and I values from a genome of an isolate or a mug. Like, you know, the, the underlying idea is yeah. it can be applied the same. So, I don't think it will be a problem. It's more a problem of the tools to scale up. Like for example, yes. it's different searching against 10,000 genomes, which we have right now and we are doing okay, versus 100,000 genomes and maybe 1 million in a couple of years. So we need to make tools. And, and so that's why, for example, I work with uh, Sirag and uh, you know the computer scientists, and I think we need to um, work with them much more, even but though they, we are on the taxonomy. But what fact, I wanna uh, say, I wanna say yeah. two things. I don't personally, I, we will see how, you know, for example, the C code um, initiative evolves, but I don't think we need to name all these marks and signs. I personally think we should name those that we care and we work and there is a good reason. The rest, let them be there with an accession number. Why we have to find a name for them. Um, there is a lot of them and, and that's not surprising because we know that the majority of of microbes haven't been described. Yeah, yeah. So, the other so, thing, so, so that's my view. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, this is a big question. We should un, uh, work together to finish uh, this big project in the next business meeting in Guangzhou, in China. Okay, we can sit down Absolutely. to talk about this big question. You're talking about yeah. sequencing the type strains, right? That's yeah. the project. I think that is one aspect. And the other aspect is how to unify GDDB, yeah, yeah. API, yeah. MEGA, and all yeah. these different uh, <laughs> databases, and come up with something that is unified version of all the all, all yeah, the yeah. different. That's what yeah. I also say. I think we need some 
we seen, we need some agreement of best practices. And, and I don't think it's the unified yeah. MIGA and GDDB. MIGA it doesn't say it's taxonomy. Challenge. Agreement among the microbiologists. It's more NCBI and GDDB, not, not MIGA. MIGA is using any taxonomy we like. We can change it very easily because we are not changing the taxonomy. The other thing I wanted to say about right. the streptomyces, two things. One is, I think we, for, for cases like this, I, I missed to make that comment. I think we need also to see the specifics of that group you want to study and name something. Right. Because there might be other reasons there and, and other important factors that they take into account. So what I said about the 16S 98.5 is my general rule of thumb. But I will also suggest to people to you know read the group they are studying and what are the best practices there and how people are doing it. And I think um, you know um, what Professor Lee said. You know. I, I mentioned that, but I'm not sure if it was clear. If it is above 98.5, you could still have a novel species. You don't know because the 16S doesn't reserve right. that level. So that's why you need to look at the and genome. And yes, you can still have a novel organism. I think I said that, but I'm not sure. sure, sure. So if it is above 98.5, you need some whole genome approach to see you know, how similar your organism is to the best match. Correct. And the but next I, question I, I would love to, 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 to work with you guys and see how we can unify things. <laughs> so, yeah. so, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's yeah. too late for you. Uh, okay, come last, please. It's, uh, yeah. Um, we'll take we'll this last question, and the question actually brings us back to the same, uh, same debate. Amongst the taxonomy of GTDB, NCBI, and MEGA, in your opinion, which is the most robust? for taxonomic assignment of specific genes? Specific genes or specific genomes? <laughs> because I don't I think, think it should be genomes. genomes. Yeah, it should be genomes. So let yeah. me repeat again. Uh, MIGA is using the taxonomy that NCBI has. So uh, it's not a, a new taxonomy. Uh, for finding the best maths, I think we have advantages with MIGA because we have this combination of average amino acid and then DNA and I, and we are very fast in, in finding. So, you know, you get an assignment in a few minutes, uh, but it, it's not a, taxo a new taxonomy. Uh, so I think the question is between NCBI and GDDB, which is the best taxonomy. <laughs> and I don't think I should right. answer that. I, I have an opinion. <laughs> Uh, and I have expressed it also to Phil. I, I have several concerns about how GDDB does it. And I think right now they are creating a lot of confusion also uh, by changing the names. Okay. And I think we need to find a solution to that. Uh, but I also have concerns that the names can change if the branching pattern of that tree changes. And they also admit it in the paper that, you know, if you have a new genome coming in, the branching pattern, because they are building a maximum likelihood tree, the branching pattern changes and that will change the names. Uh, and so there is issues there with the stability and I have expressed that to Phil um, and, and the GDDB people. And, and I have also some other concerns, but um, I think overall, and then I think NCBI is using, you know, the ICSP, the original, the, the original or the, the official taxonomy. Um, uh, but I, I do think I do think we should we should discuss we should promote new ideas you know if there are some better ways to do it why not but also to have some best practices so every user understands what the data mean and and also limitations etc because right now most people will go search on the web find something and say okay this is my organism and then I realize oh my god they are studying the same organism with me but it has a different name and, and that creates the problem so there has to be some kind of clear um, communication about uh, about this topic, I think. And, and, and then maybe, for example, the Bergis, as you know, as an umbrella, can also lead that. Um, you know, what are the best practices to do and how to make it clear to every user, like even if it's not an expert user, you know, how to interpret the information, what are the limitations, and so on. I think all of us want okay. at the end of the day a name to mean something and to communicate. So I think I think it's an important topic. Yeah. Um, thank you, Costas. I think we are done with the questions. Uh, thank <laughs> you once again for the excellent discussion. It was really enjoyable and um, 
you know, um, I think our participants will have more information and more uh, uh, databases to look through for uh, getting their uh, mags uh, classified. Um, before we close, I'll just make a quick announcement. We, uh, the next session will be taken by Professor Martha Troilo. Uh, she'll be speaking on taxonomic descriptions and reviews in need of a new working frame. Uh, so that's the topic that we are going to uh, uh, come up with. Uh, hopefully uh, our conversations today and the discussion that followed after the presentation uh, made you more uh, enthusiastic about microbial taxonomy. Uh, thank you, Costas. Uh, it's uh, almost in the morning for you. <laughs> so Thanks the, once the boys, again. the boys will wake up soon and, and I have to go yeah. play with them because it's weekend. Uh, I wanted to say thank you very much. It was a, a great um, a great opportunity for me and I, and I really enjoyed the discussion and the questions. And, and I want to I wanna second what you said. I think, you know, for the young people in, in the group, and, and I think we still have, you know, 80 plus, so they, they didn't leave. <laughs> I do think it's a great time to work on these topics, even though they, they look sometimes old fashioned. I think we have the new technologies, et cetera. So I think it makes it exciting and, and it's a good uh, area to, to be involved. And I think there's going to be a lot of development in the next five years. That's my feeling. But, you know, from my side, also, thank you very much for the invitation. And it was really, I really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining.